Welcome to Ripple Effect Connection. I'm your host, Christy Hugic. By now you all know this podcast is about the connections I've made in my life and being able to share them with you. Today's Coach's Corner is a bit different, but special. It is dedicated to a remarkable individual who profoundly impacted me and many others, but someone we lost way too soon. Stacy Perryman, my teammate at East Stroudsburg University, passed away from cancer at the age of 45 nearly four years ago. Stacy was more than just a teammate. She was a beacon of light, an educator, mentor, and an extraordinary basketball coach. Her influence reached far and wide, touching the lives of all who crossed her path. Stacy was like a sister to me. She made me a better player. She made me laugh. And we loved exchanging barbs over our differing men's college basketball allegiances. She was a Duke fan. I'm a diehard UConn fan. But we did find common ground with our shared love for UConn women's basketball. Stacy, we miss you every day, and your memory will never fade. Stacy also deeply impacted my guest today. Our coach at East Stroudsburg University, Rose Holler. Rose is currently the head women's basketball coach at Centenary University, which is a Division III school in New Jersey. In the mid-90s, she led our East Stroudsburg University team to a league championship and back-to-back NCAA appearances. She earned PSAC Coach of the Year honors in 1993 and 1994 and was also named the Division II, District II, College Coach of the Year in 94. She is enshrined in the East Stroudsburg University Hall of Fame, both as a player and as the coach of our 1995 team, a team that has also earned its place in the Warrior Hall of Fame. I am truly privileged to introduce you to someone whose influence has been a constant in my life and whose wisdom helped shape my journey. In this podcast, we reminisce a bit, talk about the life lessons sports teaches us, and the changing landscape of college sports. Welcome to a very special Coach's Corner with Rose Holler. So today it is my privilege to welcome in someone who I know very, very well, but in these, this day and age, it takes me inviting her to be on a podcast for me to see her and talk to her, but uh, Coach Rose Haller. Uh, you know, I will always call you Coach, even though I know you probably want me to call you Rose, but in my nature, I always still want to call you Coach, so welcome to the podcast. Honored to have you. So I want to go back. I ask every single guest that I have the same question at the top, and that is just your why. So, you know, for doing what you're doing and why you do what you do, what would you say that your why is? I think my why is the passion behind it. Um, so often you think when you you help or coach other people that they're getting something out of it, but often I think people find that you get more out of it than they do. So it's that, you know, it's that, that's the why you know, is the give and take and, uh, you know, and then, and then you're the why, right. You know, you, he's being in touch with those people, um, for the rest of life and seeing them succeed and, and, and then them helping others succeed. Why don't you give folks just a little bit about your background and kind of, you know, how you're obviously, you know, you've coached basketball for a long time. You've, you've been a, a teacher. Why don't you give folks just a little bit of your background and kind of how you got started in sports and then eventually into coaching? Okay. Well, my background, I think what really started me in sports was I had four older brothers and my dad put up a basketball court in our backyard. And I was also probably the only girl in the neighborhood. It was a big neighborhood. And so, as you know, back then without cell phones, you got kicked out of the house early and you played all day. And, um, we lost our first home uh, in the in the flood of Agnes in 72, and we moved to a new neighborhood, and I was probably around 11, and I met a whole new group of kids, um, Sam Bowie being one of those that went to Lebanon High School, and we then I started riding my bike to three different playgrounds every day, and we would all play. And, um, you know, so, so when you can't play anymore, then you, you know, you really don't have much of a choice, then you start coaching. Um, And that was a difficult process to not really have control anymore, right? You can ask your players to do something, but you can't be out on the court controlling for them. Um, But, you know, I was lucky enough early on in my coaching career to have some really good teams and and then things progressed from there. So that's a little of the background. What did playing sports teach you? I think playing sports teaches you a lot how to be fair, 
um, how to work hard, how to manage your time, how to lose, how to win. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if our sports are effectively teaching that anymore as much as I would like them to. Um, but, you know, when you used to go to the playground and if you got on a losing team, you would sit all night. Um, so, you know, it, it also, I think, teaches you leadership and how to work with others. Um, there's and all those things that carry over into your work life, right? How to, um, you know, keep going at something when it's hard, um, you know, which is, you know, often in the real world when when I see even with my own children first getting out in the real world, how hard it is for them, um, you know, to persevere through the hard times and and know that if you just go and work hard every day that, you know, things are going to be OK. So that I think they teach you all those things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's many times I hearken back to the times, you know, we got up at five, five thirty in the morning and had preseason conditioning and heck, we're in college. Who wants to get up that early and do that? But like those are to me like the moments that shaped us and, you know, who we were, because, yeah, that stinks. You're like, I don't you know, who wants to get up at five when you're especially when you're in college. Right. I still will hate the pool for the rest of my life, just so you know. Um, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with a kickboard. I swear it's because my legs were so short that I was so terrible at it. <laughs> but I would sprint until the cows come home. I would rather have gone in the gym and done these sprints. So I think that, um, do you find, here's a question, do you find that your kids today don't necessarily respond to that stuff as well? Because I just feel the landscape, you know, kids are different, people are different. Do you find that you've had to tweak what you do to make kids more responsive in these this day and age? Absolutely. As you know, my first uh, a couple words to you guys in the locker room, and I'll clean it up, uh, was usually <laughs> you guys really stink tonight. Um, and I knew for sure that you would all be coming out, we'll show her. And I think if you tell kids that today, kids today are often like, yeah, you're right, you know, and they're accepting of that. And so I've had to change a lot uh, of what I do in that way and how, how to motivate people and how to communicate with people. I just I do think the kids are a lot different today and they're a lot less willing to be challenged in that way. I think you have to find new ways to challenge them. What would you say your coaching philosophy would be? Well, how would you describe that? Well, it hasn't really changed from the day that I walked into ESU or four years before that at, at East Stroudsburg South High School. Is just that if we can, at the end of the day, say we worked as hard as we could, not play as good as you can, because I don't think those nights happen often. Um, if we all work as hard as we can for the day that we're given um, and then and have fun, you know, and I just have fun. And then that's it. That's my philosophy. It's, it's how you win, you know, on the nights when you don't want to be there or on the nights when, and those nights happen, no matter how good of a team or an athlete you are, you have those nights where things aren't going well. And, you know, you'd rather not be there that night uh, or, or you're not feeling well, or your boyfriend broke up with you or whatever it is, is putting those things aside for the team and knowing they'll be waiting for you at the door when you leave the gym and then just working as hard as you can for that night. And I think that's how you win championships. Getting people to buy into that is the hard part. Yeah. And I think that, you know, with us, you were always like, you gave us a lot of freedom, but when we were in that gym and it was time to work, you know, we were also ready to work, but you trusted us, you know, to make the right decisions, um, whether we did or not, because we were all still learning and growing up and, maturing and all of that but I felt like you know that was one of the the biggest things I got out of you was and my parents were kind of the same way with me where they were like we're not going to put all these restrictions or you know curfews or things like that on you we're trusting that you're going to make the proper decisions um and I know that doesn't work for everyone but and that's there's not one way of parenting or one way of coaching for sure. But it certainly it certainly did work for us. When you're going back and thinking about these philosophies and being a coach, who do you feel has influenced uh, who you are the most in your career? It's not going to be a coach, although my my grade school and high school coach, Teddy Howard, did have a huge influence on me. Um, but I would say my dad. Yeah, and he's the greatest. Tell 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 folks a little bit about your dad because he's such a wonderful human being. You you're blessed with parents. And this is why like I do this podcast too. It's like 
someone could listen to this and get things out of this that even if you didn't like basketball, you're you're going to learn like we're talking about basketball here. But if you tune out that we're talking about basketball, it kind of sounds like life. So tell folks a little bit about your dad and kind of what you feel like he's given to you. Yeah, well, my mom and dad are still married. I think it's going close to 70 years. They're 92. Uh, My dad has been in hospice three times the last two years and graduated. Um, And it's kind of the the running joke in the family now is don't get rid of any of his clothes because we can't get, you know, you'll never get rid of the guy who just keeps surviving. And he has a great attitude and a great sense of humor about it. But um, my dad was the person who, you know, we had six kids. He worked three jobs. But, you know, he would always sit you down at the kitchen table and and give you a sermon. and, And many of the things that he talked to me about were you know, hard work, doing your best, um, how you treat people, how you manage people, right, is a big thing in coaching. And so a lot of my halftime speeches are my dad's sermons to me, Um, you know, which often you think don't have anything to do with basketball. um, But, you know, sometimes you just need to motivate people on a different level uh, as far as, you know, to work together and do your best and, and sacrifice for the team and and he was big, you know, with that, with family. We had a family band. I didn't happen to be in it, but my four brothers and little sister were in it. And it was a lot of work every weekend for them to pack up all the instruments, go play, and then, you know, have everyone work together to pack those instruments up and bring them home. And, you know, practice every night it was at 10 o'clock at night at, at our house. So there were often many arguments, as you would imagine, with, you know, a band and people having. And so I watched him manage my family, right? And do a great job. So you mean that he's not the one that told you to say the big girls aren't very good tonight? Probably not. No. (laughs) But it was always their fault, just so everyone listening knows. It was was their fault. Being a guard, it was always their fault. You know, you would be like, our big girls aren't very good. And I'm definitely cleaning this up, but our big girls, our big girls aren't very good. We'd be like, yeah, you guys, what the heck? Let's go. (laughs) So yes, the the guards always blame the big girls and the big girls always blame the guards. And, but you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're a team. So, um, I had that conversation in practice last night. You did. Very good right now. See, you see, it still keeps coming. I know. And see, coach was a guard too. So that helps too. Cause you're on our side. Sometimes I feel like maybe a little bit more, you know, how we, you know, we're running things, you know, that we can get them the ball in the right position, but if they don't make a layup, you know, that's, that's, that's not going to reflect well. So what do you think the foundational elements are to building a successful team? Cause again, I think this will apply to life or basketball, but what do you think are the keys to building a successful team? Well, I think the first thing is you can't be in a hurry. You have to do it right. And I think so much of the world today is fast food. And, um, you know, I always tell my players, basketball is not fast food. You don't get what you want right away. You you might not get what you want for two years, as you know, right, mm-hmm. playing with me. Um, and so that's the first thing is that you have to start out fundamentally and you have to build it from the bottom and you have to do it right. Um, I think the other big thing is is having quality people in your program. Because what happens off the court definitely spills onto the court. Um, And so if there are a lot of issues off the court, they definitely come over. So, you know, I would say the fundamentals and setting the program and not skipping steps for wins and not allowing things to go on in your program for wins and and having people understand what your standard is and not lowering the standard to meet their expectations. And so on that note, too, how are you teaching your players to measure their success? Because I always say, like, look, of course, every team wants to win a national championship. Every team wants to win a conference championship. But at the end of the day, only one team, you know, can do those things. So how are you measuring success? Because I always think that's a hard thing when you're in a sport and only one team's going to win it all and one team's going to win the league championship. How do you teach your teams to measure their success? Well, I think that's pretty easy. I think I think even though um, sometimes it, it seems like our youth, you know, don't know the truth, they do. And they do know when they're doing their best and when they're not and when they're trying their hardest and when they're not. And I think that's the the first thing. If we can go in after a game and I can ask, did everyone work as hard as you could tonight? And everyone says yes, then we can fix whatever's wrong with us. If we go in the locker room and people are like, no, I didn't, then that's worrisome to me. And I think, you know, that you guys were the same way. If, if we played hard and we lost, 
you know, the next day we come out and we find out, work on the things we need to do to fix it. Um, but I think success also has to be measured by wins. Um, you know, that's important. Uh, it was kind of funny the beginning of the year. Last year, we didn't win a conference game. We played so many freshmen. And um, this year, it's going to pay off. But I asked them in the locker room, like, what are your goals this year? Well, we want to win three or four conference games. And my comment was, tell me which three or four you want to win because I don't want to come to the rest. Um, I think every year you have to want to come out and win a championship. And you have to strive to do that. And if you fall short, that's okay. It's okay to fail. Um, but to to not try to, you know, win the, the conference, um, I think that's a failure to not try to do, you know, the things that you're there for. Why even play if you're not trying to win a conference at, uh, you know, at the upper levels of NCAA championship. So that's, you know, I think that's important too. I think success is measured by those things too. Yeah. And I, and it, it's, you know, you have basketball, you have hardcore wins and losses. Like, you know, you see it on paper, but you know, the, at the end of the day, they probably don't always feel like it's a failure because they're learning something. Like they probably learned a ton from last year. That's going to translate to this year. And it's just like we tell patients, you know, and at the clinic, it's not necessarily a failure. It's only a failure if you don't learn from it. You, you've got to learn from what happened. You know, we're, we don't all make the right decisions. Things don't always go well. But at the end of the day, if we can learn from it, we've won. That's a victory. And if we can be better the next time, then that's a victory. So I would also say that I don't know if the average folks out there really do understand. They see the big Division One college basketball and they think that's how all of basketball is can you explain what coaching at division twos division threes like what those schools go through to actually put on to have a team because it's not it's it's not apples to apples so i always think people just don't understand what goes into how a coach operates at that level versus division one where everything you know my my good friend bill self if he and i were having this conversation be very different than you and I, right? So I wanted you to explain maybe to them just, you know, what, what it's like at the Division Two level. Well, I think it's a, a lot more of a fundamental level. You know, you, you look at the Division One level, they do demand a lot of the student athletes' time, um, but the student athletes also are treated, I don't want to say better. Um, I would say um, as far as the things they're given, they're treated better. You know, I think at, at the Division three level especially, you know, it's you're awarded for um, how academically good you are in high school, right? And so there is no athletic money at the Division three level. And so kids are really coming to play for – often the Division three players are coming because they're uh, of a more well – I don't want to say well-rounded, but they're well – they are well-rounded. They're very, they're very interested in their academics. They do love basketball. Um, but it's not just, you know, division one where maybe they're looking to go pro, right. They're going there cause they have the opportunity at the next level. I think the division three kids are well aware that most likely this is going to be their last four years, right. As, and, and the division two kids, most of them. Um, so it is a little bit different. And then, you know, just, just funding that from a coach's perspective last year, you know, our budget was 16,000 for 20 kids. That includes, you know, buses, food, hotels for 25 games. That's almost impossible. So you really have to be creative in your fundraising and in how you spend the money. And you still want to make your kids feel special off the off the court, right? You still want them to have the college experience, not just playing basketball two hours a day, but, you know, being able to do things as a team off the court. So I think you have to be a lot more creative at this level. Yeah, for sure. And recruiting is very different too. You know, it's, you don't, that's, that's different. You know, that you don't have the access to necessarily everything that, you know, a, a higher division one level would have. So how much has the landscape of like social media and the ways that you can contact and watch players clips, you know, online, how much has any of that changed your recruiting? It definitely has helped, right? The social media and being able to look at a player and and then being a, you know being able to attend the the big IV camps and those kind of things, and that's all digital now too on your phone. So it makes it a lot easier to organize yourself when you go there. Um, but I have to be honest, I still prefer to do things over the phone and in person. 
um, my first contact with a recruit will be, will you take a phone call? And then I will talk to them for sometimes two hours on the phone. I think that's the, still the most important thing is for them to get to know me and for me to get to know them. So I'm not, I do text, you know, I do text them and, and we do some social media, but for me, I'm still doing the, even with coaches, calling coaches and introducing myself and trying to get them to see what I will do for their student athlete, um, you know, moving forward and how I'll take care of them. Because in the end, I think that's what everybody wants. What do you learn from your players? Can What can you point to that you learn from your players? I think you learn a lot every year from players. Um, you know, I, it's funny because having daughters that, that are 29 and almost 25 now, I learned a lot from them on how to treat my players. And so I, I would say it's, I would say I learned from my daughters, right? Because a lot of the problems that my players come in with, I've already experienced as a mother. And so um, I'm often able to, you know, okay, well, this is, you know, it's not a serious thing. Um, but I also, you know, I, I guess my players now, we have such a diverse team that I'm actually trying to learn Spanish because they all talk in Spanish sometimes and I'd like to know what they're saying. Um, <laughs> but just to, you know, what I've learned from them is that they, they come from so many different places and it's really neat to sit down with them sometimes and just hear about where they've come from. Um, we have two young ladies on the team from the Dominican Republic and their their lifestyle in the Dominican and you know, their background, it's, it's neat to see, um, to open up, you know, I come from a small town in Lebanon, as you know, that has not changed much over the years. And so it's neat to open your eyes to how other people live. And, uh, I think the most important thing is, and, and Gary Garver, you'll remember Gary Garver taught me, um, everyone behaves the way they do for a reason. And so that's when I look at my players and, Maybe they're behaving in a way I don't like. I try to look at what the reason is and learn more about them to see why they're behaving the way they are. So I would say that is something I learned over the years as I matured, as as a coach and as a mother and those things is, is to not just judge right away, right? So hopefully that answered your question. That was a hard question. Yeah, no, it, 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 is a, it is a hard question. It is a hard question. I think, you know, you learn all the time. And I, I think that one of the things I had to deal with was the thing about being involved in sports is there is a lot of judgment involved, right? And so I had to, I found that when I did my work, you know, with, with my energy healer, Dr. Kraft, you know, I had to really dig into like everything I was doing was rooted in judgment. And you know, I was so hard on myself, right? You always said, I don't have to yell at you because I know you're going to do it for me. And, and, you know, like that was like I was like that for a long time. That didn't go away until I realized, you know, how detrimental that could be. So I know I'm sure you see these things, you know, in in students, and and th it's hard to grow up right now. Like I, I'm glad I grew up and was in college when I was. I don't think I would want. It's it would be pretty difficult, I think, to operate the way things are now. But that is one thing I had to learn. So if you had to say, like, what's a negative about sports? I think that is one of the negatives is that everything does come from come from judgment. And it can be it can be really, really tough. The other thing I think that you have to deal with and you know how I was about this. I mean, I love my parents, but I never wanted my parents to be involved with anything I was doing as far as they shouldn't be calling my coach, you know, things like that. I know you and I've talked long about that. So I think what advice would you give to parents who have a child who looks like they're going to be a player or become become a college athlete one day? What advice would you give to parents about the best way to handle that? Because you have every side of this. You have the coach's side, but you also are a mom and you know how your dad was with you. So what advice would you give parents out there that have a child that's looking to succeed? This is very simple. Let them, but let them enjoy it. Um, you know, my, my parents, I can only remember once my dad saying something to me after a game that was negative and it was because I had a bad attitude and I deserved it. Otherwise, after the game, he gave me 20 bucks and good job. Did you have fun tonight? Um, you know, what I, what I regret is my parents didn't have the money to send me to some of the back then you could do tryouts. You got invited to tryouts and I, 
I did have one at Pitt Johnstown, but we couldn't really afford to do that, right? Um, and so I think today parents are investing in their in their uh, children's futures as far as sports goes. But I think you have to be careful and you have to follow the passion of the child. I think often we take the passion away and it's not fun anymore. It becomes a job. And in college, as you know, sometimes it is a job, but the most passionate people will succeed. But I think a lot of people at, after high school are now saying, I don't want to do this anymore because it's been a job. Um, so I think you have to allow, you know, sports, as you know, you only get to play for a limited time. You should be able to enjoy them. And if a child is passionate about sports, they're going to succeed in spite of their parents, in spite of a bad coach, in spite of injuries that may come their way, they'll come back. Um, we really don't have as much control over it as we do other than to maybe ruin their experience for them. I think that it's hard, you know, it, it is, it's hard being a parent, but I also think, you know, some of the judgment that you're already experiencing being involved in sports, if you're getting that at home, then it, then it becomes, you know, pretty tough. It does become pretty tough. And again, at the division one level, it is becoming a job. I mean, it's, it's a business, you know, it's, it's a business, you know, and it, you know, you're, you can get money now. It's, it's just a different, different kind of world where, you know, we're operating back in the day and, you know, where we, we can't, you can't give us a ride to the field house because that's a violation, you know, because it's snowing out, you know, and we're, we're talking about minor, minor fish in the sea compared to what's, compared to what's going on now. So I will uh, allow us to reminisce for a few minutes because why wouldn't I, you know, if we're both on here, but you know, how often do you ever, you know, think back at what we did and what we had? And, you know, honestly, this episode should be dedicated to our good friend, Stacy Perryman, you know, who we lost you know, too early in this, this whole game of life. And she was, you know, one of the best basketball players that I've ever played around. Um, but, you know, how often do you think about what we did and how often do you hearken back to that? Well, more often than you would think, as I told you, you know, before we started, we are back to running the warrior offense uh, and the kids love it and it's going well. Um, also, there are times when I break out the press and just show uh, the emotion right behind that whole, you know, ending of that season and the, and just the press itself, how you guys were able to read. And, and uh, there's, there's one particular clip where uh, Swain is in the press and everyone else is man. And the only person, the only people that knew that was us, right? Cause you guys figured it out on the court through your communication. So there's, there were so many good things about that team that I still bring out the uh, VHS tape and try to find a machine, right, to play it. Um, and it's just it's just enjoyable to watch now and then too, right? Because it was just a really great group of kids. And that's it's hard for me to watch that as being a TV producer now and seeing <laughs> how I actually put that together back in the day. But to give everyone a little background, what happened is. We were in season and I had a project due for media communication and technology, which was my major. And I was in, you know, there was a videotaping, but it was videotape back then. You know, I'm not, you know, <laughs> that's how it was. It was videotape. And I thought to myself, how am I going to get this done with being in the heat of the season? And what am I going to do? So I'm like, all right, you know what I can do? I can make a, a highlight clip, highlight video of our season but it's pretty old school as far as like the graphics and things like that but as far as like the content you know it's it's great but coach I gotta get you a digital copy because you know you can you can there is a digital copy floating around so that way you won't have to use a VHS tape at all so I will get you that so that you don't have to deal with that the other thing is you know I think back to it you know often because we did accomplish some some stuff, and you know, I, I being an only child, the the uh, players that were on that team with me are are like sisters, and so you know, we still see each other. We're still together. You know, we've had to unfortunately get together at times of not some not so good news lately, but but that's life. So I look back to that quite often. I still have my clip of the net that's you know in my office, so I, I look back at that all the time. I still think that's a great video. <laughs> the um the uh the other thing about it is you know like look at look at that season like you know things just as a microcosm of life and every other basketball team season not everything goes really we might have ended on a positive note but things things didn't really go all that smoothly at times coach we had some we had some rough practices and some um garbage pails set up at the ends of the 
ends of the court. So maybe, you know, what what you saw and what, you know, what we kind of did that year and our success, you know, what would you look back on when you look at, you know, how we persevered that year? Right. Well, and, and I tell my players, you know, there's a reason that people jump up and down and behave like idiots when they win a championship. It's because of all the stuff that came before that, right? And you guys were all the stuff that came before that, the, the hard practices, the tough times in, at halftime, right? The, you know, the speeches and sermons and, you know, the 6 a.m.s. And, and so you, but you guys never quit, right? And it's funny how you decided to make that video and it all ended up, right? It all ended up as a championship. But um, I mean, really, you guys did all the right things to win that championship. You came every day and you worked hard and, and you listened, right? You listened and you believed. And, and that's the key is right. Is getting a team to buy in and take ownership. Um, so, I mean, still probably one of my fondest memories, um, especially with the passing of Stacy, right? One of that, that team is one of my favorite teams of all time. And it's neat that we're still in touch and we can pick up right where we left off. Um, yeah. so yeah. And I, and I often talk about that to my current recruiting classes, you know, that's really what it's all about is, you know, that, that seeing you guys with your, you know, your husbands and your kids and your careers. And, um, that's the, that's the payoff, not the paycheck in the end. Yeah, for sure. It's really great. So I, I think that, you know, often I'll think of something or see something and shoot a note to Kristen or shoot a text to PO just to see how she's doing. And, you know, we get on these group texts and I'll be like away from my phone for a while. And all of a sudden it's like, I have 62 text messages cause there's a text chain, you know, going back. So I, I still enjoy those. We'll have to, we'll have to put the episode on the text chain cause everyone's ears will probably be burning that we're talking about them. We were nice though. We didn't say anything about anybody. We didn't even bring up Claude. So. We didn't even bring up Claude. Uh, yeah, we didn't even bring up Claude. And that's the thing is like, you know, when I got there as a freshman, you know, like it's hard. You you go to college and, you know, you were a player, too. So, you know about this stuff, but you go to college and everybody who's there is like you, really, because you all did really well in high school or you probably wouldn't necessarily be, you know, getting a scholarship and so it, it is hard. It is an adjustment, you know, and I had a knee injury and, and it was, you know, I lost a year and coach, like, I feel like there's some things like right now, if I knew what I knew, if I could train, like I train, like, I feel like, you know, it could have, I wish I knew what I know now. Sure. But, you know, don't have any regrets, but you know, I wish you, and you know, I do still have a year of eligibility. I wonder if I could use that. I'll take you. Uh, you I'll know, come on down. I don't know if I don't know if I'd make it up and down one time, but maybe. If you could just go back and shoot, I'd be happy. With that. <laughs> <laughs> I, st <laughs> I still do shoot around here and there. You know, we we'll go down to the park down here and just uh, play a little horse or whatever. Alex will is always like he knows during basketball season it gets close. I get the itch. He's you know he'll say, "Hey, do you want to go down the park and shoot a little bit?" And my answer is always yes. You know, so I'm great when no one's on me and I can just stand there and shoot. <laughs> one, though, right? Yeah. right right and we all survived noontime ball too i always tell people that was probably harder than playing college basketball because you just were it could be like just the easiest time to get injured is everybody games deteriorating at lunchtime ball and then uh and then uh injuries happen so well, I think that, um, you know, I wish you the best of luck this year with the team. I'll be following you. You know, I always keep an eye on what's going on there the best I can. And uh, I, I think you're you're going to have a, a great season. And I, I thank you for, for coming on the yes. podcast. It was, a, it was a nice half hour to, to relive the glory days. Yeah, always good. Thanks, Coach. All right, thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of Ripple Effect Connection. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Centenary University head women's basketball coach, Rose Haller. Take a moment to reflect on the insights and wisdom shared. Rose talked about her philosophies, and they don't just apply to basketball. They apply to everyday life. I'm always up for talking basketball, coaching, or anything else. I'd love to hear from you, so connect with me on social media and let me know what resonated with you. Reach out on Instagram at Whole Health Christy. You can get the full show notes for this and all my episodes on my website, christyhugic.com slash podcast. Next, you can do me a favor, spread the inspiration. Like, follow, 
review, and share this podcast with others who may benefit from these stories. Stay tuned for the next episode of Ripple Effect Connection. Let's create waves of change together.